Jennifer. Yes, you're start? back. Go, I would say go ahead and start. There's one school not yet back on, but they'll join shortly. Okay. Do we wait for them? Okay. No, she said they'll join shortly. Okay. Okay, good morning. Um, we are here this morning representing the Goodwin Holocaust Museum and Education Center. My name is Helen Kirschbaum, and I'm the Educational Director of the Center. With me this morning is Sue Marika, who is one of the educators who works with us. And we're located in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which is just slightly east of Philadelphia. And we'd like to welcome the schools that are joining us this morning um, we, and ask you to introduce yourselves. So Cornell High School, are you there? And can you tell us who's in the room with you and where you're located? Cornell is reconnecting, Helen. Okay, then Catasauqua High School, we'd like to ask you to introduce yourself. Tell us who's in the room with you and where you're located. There. Um, Let me know. Yeah, hold on. You might have a code call class right now. Helen, I think cool. they're the ones uh, having audio yeah. issues. Are you available? Oh, my goodness. Up? Trouble with the Jennifer, you were right yesterday when you said I jinxed it. I, I told you, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then let's try Conrad Weiser. Would you like to start us off and introduce yourselves, please? Go ahead. Uh, we are 10th grade students in Conrad Weiser High School in Robertson, Pennsylvania. I'm sorry, we're having difficulty hearing you. Is it possible for someone to get closer to the mic? Or raise the volume? Go ahead. We are 10th grade students from Connor Weiser High School at Robazonia, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Pennsylvania. Where in Pennsylvania are you located? Robazonia. Robazonia? Robazonia. Near Reading, Pennsylvania. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much for that help. And have the other two schools signed on? I believe Cornell okay. is back. Cornell, welcome back. We'd like you to introduce yourselves and tell us who's in the room with you and where your school is located. Seems to be working well. Okay, we are broadcasting this morning from Sterling High School and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Let's see, where is the microphone? Over here near me. Can everybody hear me now? I don't know that everybody can hear. I don't hear. I can't tell anything. Hi, guys. Uh, yes, I'm Mr. Dunn, and I'm here with my senior English class from Sterling High School in Somerdale, New Jersey. Ooh. So there they are. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I think we are... Um, Having some technical difficulties. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, you can still hear us, and we can hear you. And the other schools will be able to connect shortly. Um, we're very happy to be partnering with Sterling High School, the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust Education, and Magpie. And I'd like to remind you that Magpie is recording today's program. Um, today we're here because we would like to take the opportunity to discuss with you the book Night, written by Ellie Wiesel, and Sue is going to lead that conversation, and hopefully you will be able to join in at certain points. So, Ms. Marika, why don't you start us off? Can they see us? Good morning. Um, first of all, to begin with, this is one of my real passions, is to be able to have the opportunity to talk about the book Night, and especially about the life of Elie Wiesel. Uh, for those of you, I hope that most of you have read the book. 
And Elie Wiesel, uh, if, show the picture. Oh, you can't show the picture. Uh, Elie Wiesel, uh, knowing about his background, after the war and after he was liberated, uh, he did take a vow of silence for 10 years and refused to even talk about what he had gone through. His book is really categorized as a memoir. However, a couple of the facts in that book were changed. For instance, the part of his body that was broken, the name of his father. So it really fits in the category a little bit. We're calling it a memoir or an autobiography, but um, it was rejected by 15 publishers in the late 1950s. Um, it became the most popular when Oprah uh, went to Auschwitz with him in the year of 2006. It stayed on the bestseller list for 80 weeks after that visit to Auschwitz. And I hope if you have an opportunity, you can see that on video. This was written uh, he published it in 1950, uh, I think it was 1958. The first book that was published about the Holocaust was The Diary of Anne Frank, uh, which was our first exposure to what had happened during the Holocaust. And then he says, Wiesel says himself, that this is where Anne Frank's book ends and mine begins. Today the structure will be that we will show, if we have the opportunity, we might show you some pictures if we can. Um, I did have the opportunity to go to Auschwitz about 10 years ago, and I was able to take a tour of the camp and to go to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, you will also see actual photographs of, of what I have taken when I was there, and I think that speaks very loudly. But I'd like to start with the first important quote. And it says, and this is a very famous quote, for the dead and the living, we must bear witness. And I think that really explains why Elie Wiesel published his, wrote his book and published it, so that we will never forget the horrors of the Holocaust. As we go through the pictures, what I'll do afterwards is I will pose some questions to you and I'll give each school an opportunity to respond. Um, if we can continue with some of the photographs. Just as a little bit of a background, um, Elie Wiesel was born in 1928 in Transylvania and they, he grew up in a very religious home and a very tight Jewish community. He had three sisters, two older and one younger. His sister Zipporah and his mother were cremated at Auschwitz. Once him and his father were separated, he never saw his mother or sisters ever again. These are more recent pictures. Elie Wiesel today, he's, besides being a very renowned speaker, he teaches at Boston University. I've had the opportunity to see him in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. He's come here a couple times to speak, and I saw him in Washington, D.C. also. And his message, he does not dwell on what happened to him in the camps like he did in the book. His message is that we should never forget as a, a tribute to all the victims of the Holocaust. Now we'll take a look at Auschwitz I. Auschwitz is broken into Auschwitz I and Auschwitz-Birkenau. One point million Jews were killed at Auschwitz. About between 70 and 75,000 Polish were killed. 6,500 around that of Roma, which are also known as gypsies. And 15,000 Soviet prisoners of war. This was the largest camp. When you enter the camp, there is a sign that says Abat Macht Frey, which was a euphemism, meaning and said work, it's work it will set you free or work brings freedom. 
And in the beginning, people really thought that if they did work in the camp, that they would be saved. And this was a sign in front of uh, more than one camp that work will set you free. The Nazis had a tendency to use many euphemisms. Uh, for instance, they called the gas chamber showers. They called resettlement. We're going to the east. And the final solution, they really didn't, they were not, they made the, um, the actual event seem not so bad and people really didn't understand right away. When they arrived at Auschwitz, we know from the book, they started the selection process. They were disinfected for life, their heads were shaved, and they were tattooed. This was the only camp that actually put numbers on their arms. And of course, we know that Elie Wiesel was there at the age of 15. Originally, this was established, this, these were the barracks, and they were established mainly as, a mil, as military barracks. Now, people will say, well, why didn't they try to escape? There are many reasons, and one of which is that it was double layered with uh, barbed electrified barbed wire, there were dogs, they would be shot on the spot. So, and if you tried to escape, they would take it out on some of the other prisoners. When, they, when you lined up for roll call, if there were any missing prisoners, uh, they would take the roll call, and if there was somebody missing, they would shoot somebody else in their place. Uh, you can see here there were signs all over Auschwitz even today that say halt, you know, and it shows that they didn't, couldn't go any further. They had to stop, line up, and they were interrogated by the Nazis. This is crematorium number one, and you'll see a better picture next, but the crematoriums were, of course, were built with the gas chambers, and they used something called Zyklon B, which was an inexpensive um, insecticide that they put through and combined with carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, excuse me, carbon monoxide. And you'll see the residue on the walls today at Auschwitz of where that gas came through. There is a canister of gas. This is the entrance to the crematorium. Many books, Holocaust books, will talk about uh, lining up and being sent to what they called, they thought they were going to the showers. They would say we're going to the showers, and some people did not know what was ahead. And this, that actually, the gas chambers actually looked, there were shower heads. And the Nazis played games with them many times, and sometimes they would really put on a shower and other times it would be gas, and they never knew what was going to happen. This is what the Zyklon B looks like. They are just little pellets. It's odorless. Um, they put it right through. You can see in the next picture, they put it right through the ceiling. That blue residue is the, uh, what's left over as it was piped in through the walls. This is what's left over on the walls. You could see that today. And the crematorium which were built was to dispose of the bodies. Um, they didn't, actually they built them because they really had so many bodies of people that were killed that they had to have a way of disposing the bodies. They were just taking up too much room. They used to put them on carts and throw them in, you know, just throw them into ditches. And they ran out of room and they built the crematorium as a efficient way of getting rid of victims' bodies. Buna was where, El, where he was sent, El Wiesel, and that was a work camp. And if you remember that in order to go to a work camp, which they thought would really save them, they would take blood from their fingers and put it on their cheeks so that they would look healthy. The younger you were, 
the more likely you could be sent to Buna or to a labor camp as opposed to the death camp. And unfortunately, they worked so hard, they didn't eat, they were mistreated, that many of them were killed there anyway, even though it was a work camp. In most cases, they built ammunition or things for the Nazis. Some people made boots for them. Some people made armory, bullets, anything. They had different jobs for them. But the selection process, the healthier you were, the more likely you would go to a labor camp. Auschwitz II was Birkenau, and that was the biggest part of the camp. And by the time we reached to the near, nearer to the end of the Holocaust, uh, 100,000 prisoners were sent there daily. That's how many. The train tracks go right into Auschwitz, and it was put in Poland with all the other death camps so that people in Germany did not know what was, they said they did not know what was going on, and people in Poland, they put it in remote places. This is what Auschwitz-Birkenau looks like today. All it, are, all it is is barbed wire fences, watchtowers where the Nazis stayed, where they could watch the prisoners, and the barracks. This is the entrance to Birkenau. Different entrance to Birkenau than it was to Auschwitz I. Auschwitz I, because it says work will set you free, people in the very beginning of the Holocaust really did not realize they were going to die there. Now, at the end, when they knew that it was getting close to liberation, um, the Nazis very quickly tried to move people, and they took them on what we call death marches. And many people died on those death marches. But they sent, I know Elie Wiesel they, and others went to Buchenwald, which was a concentration camp. This picture is one of the most famous Holocaust pictures, and... The picture where I have the arrow is actually a picture of Elie Wiesel in his bunk at Buchenwald. And before we go into questions, I would like to share one of the quotes from his book that I think really summarizes him and what he was feeling. Never shall I forget that night the first night in camp, which has turned my life into one long night, seven times cursed and seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the little faces of the children whose bodies I saw turned into wreaths of smoke beneath a silent blue sky. Never shall I forget those flames which consumed my faith forever. Never shall I forget that nocturnal silence which deprived me for all eternity of the desire to live. Never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to dust. Never shall I forget these things even if I am condemned to live as long as God himself, never. And I will end with, um, if you could just show a picture first on the last page of the picture. At, at, um, I had gone to some other um, camps, and at the Camp Maidon, Maidonic, they have, these are actual shoes of victims, of prisoners, starting from baby shoes all the way up to adults. And it left such an impact on me, um, the smell, the look of it. And I found a, a quote that I think is very appropriate. We are the shoes. We are the last witnesses. We are the shoes from grandchildren and grandfathers from Prague, Paris, and Amsterdam. And because we are only made of fabric and leather and not of blood and flesh, each one of us avoided the hellfire. And I'm going to end my lecture part of this at this point. 
and I will be glad to answer lots of questions. I'll give you an opportunity to ask questions, and I am going to pose some questions to you, hoping that they're not questions, literal recall questions. They're going to be questions that make you think a little bit about what you can do and what your opportunities are to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. Okay, we're going to begin. Which, which schools are on now? Cornell High School, have you been able to join us? If you have, could you introduce yourselves before we start the questions? Helen, I believe Helen. Cornell is on, but they're having audio issues, and so they're going to text me their questions via Skype, which I will relay to you. So give them just a second to kind of catch up with us, uh, maybe okay. move on to Conrad Weiser. <laughs> Um, has Katasakwa been able to join us? I don't believe so. There is another school connected. Okay, uh, this is Katasakwa. We'll, um, we'll be with you shortly. Oh, great. Okay. So, do you want them to ask you questions first? Uh, uh, well, well, I could start with, are there any questions that you would like to pose to me? Conrad Weiser, it seems like you're going to start us off. Okay, Mark, nice and loud. Um, do you feel as if the book impacted your life? If so, how and why? Say that What does it say? I can't. I'm sorry, we need you to repeat that for us. Louder. Louder. <laughs> do you feel as if the book impacted your life? If so, how and why? Do I feel that? Thank you. Do you feel that the book impacted your life, and if so, why? There's no question that any book that I have read or uh, of a survivor or, or seen an actual survivor has a tremendous impact, and you realize how sacred life is and how important it is to speak up about the injustices, because we see it happening still around the world. And people are still silent. And I think if we had spoken up, we could have prevented the lives, lost lives of 6 million Jews and 5 million other people. But yes, I think, and going to Auschwitz itself or going to the concentration camps um, definitely left an impact on me. Thank you. That was a good question. Thank you. Sterling, do you have any questions that you would like to ask? Anyone? I'm going to pose a question, if you wouldn't mind, okay. to Sterling. Why do you think it's important to learn about and remember the Holocaust? And what are the lessons that you learn from learning this topic, and how does it apply to today? That's a lot of different parts to it. Anybody want to try and answer? Oh, good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're barely able to hear you, so I'm guessing well, they're said not here. It, it, you, appreciate, you get to appreciate your family better, which I agree with you. Yes. I think it's important to appreciate the culture of being Jewish and your family, even if you're not Jewish, to remembering the culture of your past and learn about what we could do to prevent it in the future and how it affects your family members and never to let something happen like that again. And just really appreciate and always remember even reading literature and the going to museums. That's what I think. Thank you. That's very yeah. good. And I would like to add to that because uh, many of the survivors now are approaching, they're in their 80s and 90s, and there will not be people left to tell the story of the Holocaust. That's why it's important for you as young people to read the memoirs and tell people of the story of the Holocaust. Uh, are, any other, are there any other questions before I pose some more? Okay. Um, Jennifer, did Cornell send you any questions that you wanted to share with us? Not yet, but as soon as I get one, I'll let you know. Okay. And Katasakwa, are you able to speak to us yet? Uh, not at this time, but we may have some a little later on. Are you hearing us, though? 
Yes, we are. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> we have a question here, Alan. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, so Sterling has one more question before we move on. Mind your business. Uh, how is it? How is it like personally for you? Like the, the experience seeing the camps and all the rooms and stuff like that. How is it for you personally? Okay, that's a very good question. I know when I speak, I sound like it. I sound very much like a teacher. I'm telling you a story. It almost seems like I'm not as emotional. Um, I have been teaching Holocaust now for 25, uh, over 25 years. And going to the camps, it was so emotional for me. I mean, I cried the whole trip practically. But I felt that it was necessary, if I'm teaching this subject, it was really necessary for me to witness it. And when I was there, I have to tell you, I felt like, the Nazis were there. I felt like the, they talk about the music that they played when the people arrived on the train. I felt you could feel that music. You could feel the people. I saw drawings on the walls of the bunks where people had written and drawn pictures. It's very, very emotional. Um, a lot of people ask me, well, how can you teach this? And I, I guess because I feel it's so important that I have and I can't say distance myself, but I've tried to remain as stoic as possible. Good question. Yeah. Okay. Conrad um, Weiser one, has a question. Okay. Um, in Chapter 6 of Night, when Eli and Juliet were battling suffocation and Juliet played his violin, what were some adjectives or characteristics you would put for them to characters and of the events that happened? Chapter six. I have the book with me. Okay. Uh, I apologize. We are having difficulty hearing you. We heard you say in chapter six, and then something about adjectives, but I didn't get the part in the middle. Did you? Um, so I have chapter six. six. Chapter six, um, where Eli and Juliet were battling suffocation. And Juliet played his, guitar, his violin, and um, it was out of. He played the Beethoven song that he knew wasn't allowed to be played. What would be the adjectives or characteristics you would play or you would put for them two characters? Well, I think that he does a much better job than I do. Um, when I look at this chapter, um, first of all, his description here of everything around me was dancing a dance of death. Um, not a cry of distress, not a groan, nothing but a mass agony in silence. No one asked anyone else for help. You died because you had to die. I mean, I think that uh, Elie Wiesel does a lot better job than I do. Um, I think the whole book, through his use of metaphors and similes and uh, figurative language, like wild beasts of prey with animal hatred in their eyes. To me, that I mean, describes the Nazi, par the Nazi party that are there. Um, an extraordinary vitality, it sees them sharpening their teeth and nails. And then, of course, we have the dogs in there as well. But I think that that's, that's a very powerful chapter, by the way. But thank you for that question. Thank you. Okay, do you want to pose a question? I'd like to pose another question. We're going to bring it, start to bring it a little bit to present day. Who am I asking it to? Anybody? Well, we're going Actually, to Actually, before you do that, I do have a question for Cornell, if, from Cornell. Okay. If oh, you good. Wanted, yeah. Uh, the ahead. question from Cornell is, when you went to Auschwitz, did you make any connections between the camp and the book? Oh, absolutely. It was the book. Um, I, when I went, I thought of all of the books I had read, as well as the survivors that I have met that had survived Auschwitz. And I, I couldn't, I looked at the bunks, I looked at the showers, I said, I don't even know how they had the fortitude to go through that. How do you not lose hope? How do you maintain calm in that situation. I mean, 
uh, I mean, many people did kill themselves, I know. Many died from just uh, heartbreak when they saw another family member die. But I just couldn't, um, I, you identify much more with it. And then I watched the Oprah and Ellie Wiesel when he, they went together in 2006. And, of course, I was reliving the same thing all over again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to pose a question about today. And I'm thinking more about how, what we can do. Like, in what ways can we speak out today to bring our attention to the world of the human rights issues that are taking place all over the world today? We know there's a pro we, have a, we have problems all over the world of people being abused and whether people speak up. What can we do as either a student population or as the United States, but what can we do globally? Conrad Reiser, why don't you start us off? They're still there, Helen. They're just muted, so maybe they're taking a second to unmute. Don't be me. Okay. Right. <laughs> just looking for a volunteer. Okay. Make love to Right. This hard. Don't be basis. One way I know we could stop abuse is by speaking up and not letting something um, just continue. If you see it, you need to open your eyes and kind of realize that there is people that need the help and um, there's a lot of you know hotlines and call. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you could do. Open societies, um, paying it forward is a big thing because then it helps people realize that they need to join things and just kind of be there for the people and. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did somebody from Sterling have, did you have, anybody have a comment on that, what we can do? Maybe you could relate it to our new bullying law. In New, in new Jersey has a bullying law, um, which means they really are cracking down, we're trying very hard to crack down on bullying and really um, making sure that the, the victims are protected and the uh, perpetrators are punished or take a consequence. How does this relate to bullying? We have a comment here by bringing awareness. Um, we have seen too many people whose lives were lost through bullying where nobody spoke up. And a lot of times we could speak up way before these things escalate. Between all of the um, technology we have today, a lot of times students will cry out for help. And you know that through Facebook, through Twitter. Um, I think was the girl, somebody mentioned before about uh, speaking out, to be an upstander, somebody who goes and tells somebody and not lets it escalate. So I think that's an important message because the Holocaust even though it's on a much larger scale on our pyramid of hate, it really escalated to the murder of so many people. Excuse me, Helen, I do have a response from Cornell. Great. Okay. The, the students in Cornell have said uh, to start small and don't feel that it's necessary to change the world as a whole thing right away. Making uh, awareness is key, and don't forget to speak out. It's very important to make sure your words are heard. Excellent. Absolutely. Good response. Thank you, Cornell. I'd like to throw another question out here about the title of the book. The title of the book is called Night. By the way, Ellie Wiesel also wrote a book called Dawn, uh, different titles. But the book is called Night. How does that connect? to the theme of the book? Anybody want to respond to that? Ethan? 
Come on up. Come on up. There's a sterling response. Uh, I guess, I guess the reason why it's called night is because like maybe he was like trying to remember all, all the stuff that happened and how dark it was, like, like emotionally and how sad seeing all those people die and stuff. It's just not a fun sight, I guess. That, that was a good answer. Yeah. And if you remember, I said he took a vow of silence for ten years. After the after the end after the Holocaust ended in 1945. Yeah, maybe he was just horrified by it. Mm hmm Yeah, he, it's just it just painted a dark image in his head. That's why. That's a good answer. Book. While you're up here, do you think this book is important to read? Uh yeah, I think so personally because it just like opens people people's eyes about what's what went on in the world, what can happen possibly again. I give just mm -hmm. just right off the top of my head. Excellent answer. Thank you very much. Did anybody else want to respond to that question about the title and the reason that he really wrote this book? Conrad Weiser does. Um, Good. Uh, the book night, the title, I guess, could refer to the dark times that everybody was going through, especially in his life, as well as all the other Jewish people and, uh, I guess, even, even the Russians and everything else that was going on at the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, good answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we, and we have a reply from Cornell as well. Um, good. Cornell says that he entered the camp at night and his life became an endless period of darkness because he was stripped of his spirituality. Very. That's very, very deep. That's very good answer. Thank you, Cornell. Excellent. Um, has anybody, I would like to throw out just a question about other Holocaust books that students may have read that they would like to share with our audience today because there are so many good books on the Holocaust. Some of them are historical fiction. Many of them are memoirs. And um, anybody read any books that they feel they would like to share? We do. Oh, good. <laughs> Uh, a Boy Who Dared. What's it called? A Boy Who Dared. A Boy Who, who dared. dared. Do you know the author? I'm not sure. I, I remember I read it like a while ago. And is it a um, is it a first person account or is it a historical fiction? Um, it's the story of um, of a boy. But he did die at the end, so it's an account. It's like one of his friends okay. who went through it with him. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I wrote it down. I'm going to check yeah, it out. I'm not familiar with that. I'm one not either. either. Anyone else have any other Holocaust stories they'd like to share with us? Yes, we do. We have someone here. Number of the stars. Number, Number of the, the stars. stars. That is that is a very good book to start teaching people about uh, the importance of um, rescue was one part of it because the Danish did rescue uh, their people by fi the fishing boats. It also talks about, a f it's a friendship theme in there as well, but it's a very nice first overview. Uh, Diary of Anne Frank is another one. It's probably the first book I ever read about the Holocaust. And... I think that piqued my interest in learning more because it was more about a girl growing up during the Holocaust and not necessarily about the facts of the Holocaust. I knew very, very little when I first started. We have a couple other suggestions here. The Boy in the Striped Pajamas is another one. Um, I have read that. I also saw the movie. Um, the, the movie has a few what I would call inaccuracies in there. Um, to be very honest, it would have been very difficult for someone on the outside of a camp to make friends with someone inside the camp. Um, there were too many Nazis patrolling to allow that to happen. Um, that's why when you do see films and read books, you do have to look at the credibility and really what is real and what is not. It's a very good story. But it really, there are some, some things in there that really couldn't have happened during the Holocaust. She had another one. Do you have another one? Uh, I, think, uh, I think I found the, the author's name for that book. Oh, thank you. The, uh, it, said, it 
sitting right here that read by David Ackroyd. Ackroyd, did you say? He's checking to see the author of that book, uh, The Boy Who Dared. Uh, I'm not sure. It says read by, that may be the audio of it. Yeah. Yeah. What was the okay. other one that you wanted to suggest? Uh, I was just to ask, that's a, the question that was just posed by Sterling was, did I ever have any family members that may have died during the Holocaust? I am not, I don't know if I did, but I would assume because my family did come from Europe that there had to be some family members that did perish. Um, I don't know of any. I've done family histories and I have not seen, you know, it could be cousins, um, you know, removed family members. But remember, they all did come from Europe. My family came from Romania and I'm sure that they tried to escape. Uh, during, even before that, uh, my family was lucky. I know my grandparents left during the pogroms in the late 1800s, early 1900s, my great-grandparents. So I know that they were out of Europe at that time. My mother uh, lived through this. She uh, lived in England. And they did have an underground shelter at their home where they did have, uh, people did stay as, we used to call it, it was similar to what we call the kinder transport. Uh, they would send Jewish families that were trying to escape. They would stay in their underground. They had food and uh, it would keep them sheltered until they could go on to another um, place and get out of, you know, get try to get out of Europe. But they were not, I don't know of anybody specifically. Toledi? Yeah. Mark, Mark Toledi? Okay, Bartoletti. thank you. Um, one of the books that I'd like to suggest, to see a different perspective, there is a, a, a former Hitler Youth member. His name was, um, let me, I just went blank. Um, the Heil Hitler one. Um, oh, I don't remember it. There is one. It's called Parallel Journeys. Parallel Journeys is a book that is written by a former Hitler Youth member and a Holocaust survivor. And they, it's called Parallel Journeys because it parallels their lives as to what is happening as soon as Hitler comes to power, how the life changes for the Jewish girl who was the survivor, and for this boy who becomes a very active member of the Hitler Youth and starts to, his best friends start out, they, he has Jewish friends, he turns against them, and at the end of the book he does come forward with the fact of how he was brainwashed into being a Hitler Youth member and um, what, how mean he was to the Jews He's not saying he's sorry as much as he is telling what happened through his lifetime. It's called Parallel Journeys, and there's also a movie, a documentary, that's very powerful called Heil Hitler, Confessions of a Hitler Youth. And if I can remember his name, but I'm sure you could look that up. And it's very interesting to see a different perspective of the Holocaust um, besides um, the victim, to hear somebody who was a perpetrator and how they feel. Um, Excuse are me, there any more? Uh, yeah. Oh, just, I'm out. sorry. I just wanted to to answer for Cornell that they have some books that they have read. Great. Okay. Is that okay. So Absolutely. Cornell, Wonderful. And they say at Cornell we have read Dawn, The Book Thief, Sarah's yeah. Key, Between mm -hmm. Shades of Gray, and The Zookeeper's Wife. And they've also read the comic book uh, Mouse. Mm -hmm. Wow. Which they've read, which is about the Holocaust. So they just wanted mm -hmm. to chime in there. Those are some very, very powerful books. Uh, Sarah Key deals with the, fr uh, the, the French during the Holocaust, the Roundup. Uh, the Zookeeper's Wife is a true story. Mouse is an, an interesting way of teaching the Holocaust. 
It is in comic book form, although very serious, uh, very well done. Uh, the Book Thief is a first-person uh, book that I found one of the most interesting books I had ever read. Uh, very, very different, but it's a very, very good read. Uh, thank you for sharing those. Those were good ones. Yeah, Cornell, you seem to have a wonderful selection. We'd like to also suggest Salvage Pages might be a good one to add to your list. It was written by Alexandra Sapruder, and I think you'll find that one to be really interesting also. And, of course, as films go, there are many good films to see as well. And as I said, you just have to be careful with what's fact and what is fiction. Schindler's List is probably the most accurate to historical, as far as factual information. The Holocaust Museum in Washington says that it's probably the one that has the mo it's most accurate historically. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have. Yes. The Pianist is really that's a, that's also a very powerful movie. That one I think is quite accurate. Movies like Life Is Beautiful may not be as accurate. Uh, you have to look at the content, but yes, The Pianist is a wonderful movie. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Did you, did I was just going to say, as long as we're talking about movies, if you get the opportunity to watch the movie Defiance, oh, uh -huh. that's an excellent one. And um, we actually have a survivor in our community who was in the woods with the Bielski group that's featured in that movie. And she also has said how accurate and realistic that one is. So that's an excellent one to suggest. Um, I'm not sure how realistic. Swing Kids is a great way to find out how propaganda was perpetrated and how people really got into the mindset of what Hitler really wanted the people to be. I think it's very good. That's very accurate. Um, and even if you, uh, for the teachers, if you only show even some excerpts of these, it's just enough to give your students a good feel for uh, what was happening at the time. I would like to really now pose a really high-level question, a higher-level thinking question, as far as there's no right or wrong answer. How do you feel about former Nazis being hunted down today and being placed for trial for war crimes? An example is Demianyuk, who was a guard at Sobibor, who was probably, uh, who had been living 30 years in the United States as if nothing ever happened. And we know there are many Nazis living in, uh, around the world today. Uh, do we have a responsibility? Or, and now they're old. They're in their 80s and 90s. Do we have a responsibility to hunt them down, like Simon Wiesenthal did? Or should we let it go because they're old? Conrad Weiser, we're going to let you start off the answer to those to that question. Uh, personally, I feel that they should just let them go because if we keep um, hunting them down and trying to um, put them on trial, we'll never be able to try to um, move on. And because this is just leading to more violence, I think we need to try to lead more towards peace and just let them go. If we let them go, it will show them that it will give them more respect. Okay. But, Thank you. That's interesting. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody from Sterling want to answer that question? Do we have a response from anybody? Cornell has a response when you're Good. ready. Good. Okay, go ahead. We're going to let Sterling think a little bit here. Okay. Cornell was pretty quick about their response, and they say mm -hmm. that they deserve to be punished for their crimes, mm -hmm. even though it happened very long ago. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure many people feel both ways. There is another book, now that we're talking about this, I'd like to recommend also. It's called Sunflower, uh, The Possibilities of Something. But what it is, it's different excerpts from peop real people of what they would do if they, if they found a Nazi in a hospital dying. And the Dalai Lama puts a, uh, uh, his response famous people of what they would do. And again, mixed answers. Some would let him die. Some would help him. So uh, there is no right or wrong answer here. This is, then is, this is really a moral issue of what you think should happen. 
Yes. I feel this is from Sterling. Okay. So, um, Sterling, for those of you who didn't hear, the response was basically to let it, the past go. Um, if it's like, if she's given an example, if it were your father, who you find out was a Nazi, and there's many books uh, written about that too, where uh, someone grows up never knowing that his, their father was part of the Nazi party. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe back then, uh, maybe in some cases they probably they didn't want to do it, maybe they were forced to do it, or maybe they just like didn't have a full understanding of what it would do to to to, to, to people in the, in the world. Like, they repeat what you saw. I mean, there is there is that possibility that they I mean, they were forced to do this. Yeah. They, and then we know that many people were forced to become part of the Nazi party, part of the Hitler Youth Movement, even against their parents. Many of the people were forced to do that. That is true. Because, because everybody, like, doesn't stand a chance. Like, we're all human beings, and, you know, like, we can't, like, dwell on the past. We've got to, like, kind of like, let it go. Mm-hmm. Like, like, let it go. Mm -hmm. Try to help the future. Help the future. And that's what we're hoping. That was the purpose of this book talk today, was that you are the future. You are the ones that will make a difference. And by studying Holocaust and other genocides, it opens your eyes to what happened around the world or is still happening, and not to be a bystander and to speak up against injustices. I was fortunate to go two weeks ago to the 20th anniversary celebration of the creation of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., where Elie Wiesel and former President Bill Clinton were both speaking. And um, they talked about how 20 years ago they both had also been the keynote speakers when the Holocaust Museum was created. And at that point in time, Elie Wiesel had said to Bill Clinton, who was president at that time, that he, the president needed to take American troops into Bosnia, that genocide was happening there, and that America needed to pay attention to what was going on in the world. And that was his way of speaking up. This is not a study of just the history of what happened during the Holocaust, but a study that we need to be aware of what's going on in the world around us, in our communities, um, in our schools. And President Clinton, former President Clinton, called the Holocaust Museum the conscience of the nation because it teaches us lessons and brings up issues that need to be thought through and make us aware that we need to help people who are being treated unfairly because of their race, their religion, um, or in your school it could be because they're wearing the wrong sneakers. Um, you need to not stand by and watch other people being treated unfairly. As we've said so many times, we need all of you to be upstanders rather than bystanders in your world. So um, it was really a very moving opportunity to be there for the 20th anniversary. There were over 800 Holocaust survivors who were there that day. And um, it seemed like an amazing number until one of the survivors I was with said to me, but, Helen, there were 20,000 Holocaust survivors here on the day that the museum opened. Mm -hmm. And so you can see in the 20 years these eyewitnesses to history have diminished, and there are fewer and fewer with us to share these stories. And that's why it's so much 
more important today for you to hear the eyewitness testimony of survivors, to remember the stories that Ellie Wiesel is telling you, and to share them with other people so that you can make sure that these kinds of things and this kind of hatred is not allowed to exist in our world. Um, we're going to actually ask the schools if they each have a final comment. Um, Katasako, we're going to start with you. Are you able to talk to us yet? I'm guessing that's a no. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope that you were there and at least could hear everyone's questions and answers. Conrad Reiser, do you have a last comment you'd like to share with us? We do. Um, going off of what you guys are saying about um, how we feel about it and moving on, um, mm -hmm. we there's far, far more things ahead, and we have to leave the stuff that has happened behind but never forget what it's taught us. Um, we have to realize that there is a lot of people that are in need. There's a lot of people that need help. And we, as us kids today, have to face that fact and be the ones to help other people and to change the world. And, and thank, you. That's, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you thank so you much. Um, is there anyone here from Sterling who would like to add a final comment? Come on up. <laughs> Are there only two people in this class? I think so. <laughs> um, I want to propose a question either to the school, like, how do you feel about genocide today in Africa or even in the other wars that are going on as opposed to being in the Holocaust? How do you feel? Well, comparatively? Yeah. yeah. I don't think that really that we compare Holocaust and genocide. Holocaust was a watershed event, though, in the fact that it was, it began with people that the highest educated people, the doctors, the, uh, all of the people that were really in high authority, as well as technology. It's the first time that modern technology was incorporated into an event. That's why that we don't really compare genocide. They're all horrible. They, there's no question. But the Holocaust was very different from other genocides due to the fact that the people that participated in it were those of the highest um, jobs in the country, the people with the most educated people. Do you want to add to that one? Um, no. Unfortunately, we yes, can't throw the question back question, to the no. other schools because we're out of time. But it is important to think about what's happening today and to realize that, as they said um, at Conrad Weiser, we need to remember the lessons that the Holocaust has taught us as we look at today's world. Um, Jennifer, did Cornell have a final comment for us? They do. Thank you. I know we're running over, but very quickly, their final uh, closing comments are that they feel we need to use the Holocaust as an analogy for our lives so that we don't let people get treated unequally in any way, so that nothing like the Holocaust ever happens again. I clap on that one. Thank you all very much for joining us today, and we hope that you will remember all of the lessons that the Holocaust has to teach us. Have a nice day. Thank you all. Thank you.